I came from King Saud University, um, <coughs> and they want to start with, with showing this uh, photo, uh, which was taken in uh, 1978. <coughs> uh, I'm showing it for two reasons. The first is uh, <coughs> this is King Salman bin Abdulaziz, the king of uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, <coughs> and uh, the second person here is uh, Professor Abdul Aziz Al Fadda. He's my father. So they were discussing the university campus then uh, <coughs> and trying to organize something to be uh, good architecture, beautiful, and, and so on. So <coughs> uh, King Saud University is the first university in Saudi Arabia, uh, one of the biggest universities worldwide in terms of area. Uh, with a nice architecture, I hope uh, you will have a chance to visit us uh, in the university, and this is the College of Medicine from which I graduated. <coughs> um, so without uh, further delays, we, the topic today, uh, as you uh, know, is one of the uh, most interesting topics worldwide, since uh, obesity um, <coughs> is increasing in terms of uh, prevalence and incidence. Um, <coughs> and it's um, shown clearly that uh, body weight is related to uh, mortality. And this is the classical uh, J-shape, um, which showed the relation between <coughs> the body mass index and mortality ratio. Um, <coughs> so when somebody is gaining weight, their mortality is increasing. And also when they are underweight, they have an increased uh, mortality, a classical J-shape. <coughs> so the, um, uni the university, or King Saud University, Obesity Research Center was established as an initiative of the National Plan of Science and Technology, um, <coughs> which um, was implemented um, about five years ago. And the center um, trying to study obesity from different uh, perspectives. So <coughs> I got uh, some slides to compare the prevalence of obesity uh, between Saudi Arabia and Italy. <coughs> and this is from WHO in 2011. And you can see that we beat Italy here. Uh, we, we, we have uh, more than 30% of our population uh, uh, in this um, abnormal uh, uh, body fat uh, accumulation. And in, in Italy, it's about 10 to 20%. And the reason for that is um, very clear. Uh, in the last uh, few years, we have an increment in the uh, percentage of uh, available energy from fat. Uh, thanks to the fast food, so uh, w w uh, whether you are from uh, a high income or low, in low income country, the, the percentage of the energy that we are consuming is more uh, fat. And also, we have been sedentary uh, as well, uh, males and females. And uh, also here in Saudi Arabia, according to this data, we have about more than 60% of people are not achieving uh, the, the physical activity uh, limit that would, uh, would uh, make you physically active. And then in Italy, in males, uh, they are about uh, half of that percent. And also in the females, uh, uh, you have um, the same problem as well. And I think the females in Italy is less active than males, according to the data here. <coughs> so um, <coughs> this definitely uh, had led to an increment in the prevalence of obesity in Europe and in the Eastern Mediterranean region uh, with significant impact on health of people. <coughs> uh, in uh, specific studies from Saudi Arabia, we have about four major landmark studies which showed that uh, the, the prevalence of obesity has been uh, sort of stable uh, until uh, around 2003, where we have significant increase of obesity in males and females and I think um, something happened here which, which make um, the physical activity less and the people consuming more unhealthy food. <coughs> and in Italy, uh, I found several studies as well. Uh, this is one of the um, interesting studies uh, which uh, <coughs> they, they basically measure the body mass index in, in males <coughs> and females. And the overweight prevalence was 48% in men and 33% in women. Um, and the, um, uh, the obesity prevalence, 26% in men and 27 in women. <coughs> and uh, the uh, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development has uh, projected um, <coughs> the um, body weight in different um, countries in the world. And uh, you can see here that it's expected that in Italy, 
the prevalence of obesity and overweight will increase uh, in the coming uh, 10 to 20 years. <coughs> so um, we have such a big challenge in, in studying this complex disease. Uh, it, is not, um, it is not a disease that is uh, mainly focused on one gene that we can tackle and study. There are a lot of things going on to determine your body weight. Uh, you ha we have the biology, we have the environment, we have um, the policy of food and uh, um, many uh, factors going on, uh, especially in children where we have the uh, family influence on what the, the children are eating, <laughs> what activity they are doing, so, so it's nothing easy to tackle. Uh, in the center we had focused on something um, that would explain the relation of obesity to its complications. About 30% of obese individuals, uh, they have what we call the healthy obese state. They have no complications related to obesity. They are fat, but they are not diabetic, not dyslipidemic, no hypertension, about 30%. So um, what makes people healthy, uh, even if they are obese and others are unhealthy? Uh, <coughs> so to, uh, to answer this question, uh, we try to link uh, our clinical experience uh, with um, basic research and sort of translation research to um, answer some of the uh, questions that would link obesity to its complications. Uh, <coughs> we are lucky to, to have in, in our um, hospital a um, uh, good clinical setting where we um, have uh, very good um, clinical data about the patient who visit us in the clinic. Um, and uh, beside that we have the um, uh, lab uh, or the uh, basic science lab. So, so we have uh, exchange of ideas and uh, flow of samples nicely between these two um, sides, uh, which uh, make it very easy for us to, to get uh, interesting data. The body fat is, um, have different functions in different areas of the body. Um, uh, you have the subcutaneous, the vis visceral, the thigh region, and the arm region. So uh, each uh, site um, uh, mostly have significant uh, function different than the other. Uh, so we, we try to um, uh, optimize the primary adipocyte harvesting technique um, <coughs> and uh, we succeeded on that. So we take uh, fat cells by liposuction from these areas and then we process the sample um, with different techniques uh, including the collagenase digestion and then we have um, separation step and then we wash it and then we separate the um, uh, primary adipocytes. Uh, we can uh, treat that with whatever uh, treatment we can give. And then we have the, um, uh, say the uh, SDF, which is uh, containing mostly the pre-adipocytes and some other cells, uh, which we can differentiate to uh, mature adipocytes. Uh, this technique has been um, very uh, helpful for us in studying uh, the uh, adipocyte biology. <coughs> so uh, we established the biobank and the registry for these samples. We, um <coughs> we have for now 189 uh, paired subcutaneous and visceral samples and 56 uh, liposuction uh, samples. Uh, some of them are from different uh, regions in the body. Uh, so we, we have um, the, this biobank uh, clearly mentioned the sample type, the volume, and um, the storage temperature, and all the details of the samples. <coughs> so uh, whatever study you would like to do, we go back to the bank and, and try to answer the question that we have. <coughs> also, we have a cohort of uh, bariatric surgery. Um, we follow them after doing the surgery. So we see them um, as baseline. Uh, the surgeon will provide us with uh, basic data, with uh, visceral and subcutaneous fat and then they come to our clinic and we follow them for uh, the weight reduction. And this is a preliminary data from uh, about uh, 150 uh, bariatric uh, patients who uh, showed clearly the classical drop in their body weight after the surgery in the first uh, one year or 18 months. And then they, <coughs> they start to increase their body weight about uh, 20 to 30% and most likely they are going to plateau. So this is the classical response post bariatric surgery. So we take samples from them in each uh, point here, uh, trying also to follow up um, on the um, changes that occur with uh, body change, with the weight change. Uh, our protomic facility has been established in collaboration with the University of Colorado Denver. 
uh, where we have um, mass spec um, uh, that allow us to s study um, and protein, um, um, uh, and then we have also uh, metabolomic um, um, uh, facility uh, that we are going to uh, start soon uh, running some of our samples on. And we base our uh, uh, studies on uh, 2D gel, where we separate the samples, and then we uh, take the spots, identify the spots, and um, do the analysis, and I'll show you some examples of the work that we have done. So this is one of the uh, uh, first uh, projects that we have done. Uh, interestingly, we, we know that um, we can achieve weight loss by different mechanisms, whether by diet or medications or surgery. <coughs> but uh, if we achieve the same weight reduction, would that uh, have the same uh, effect on biology or the same effect on molecules in the body? And uh, we, we um <coughs> studied uh, five patients uh, that succeeded in reducing their body weight on um, low calorie diet, about 1,500 kilocalories per day, and seven patients underwent surgery, and uh, no significant difference in the age, uh, <coughs> and you can see the significant drop in the, in the uh, BMI, uh, more, of course, in the, in the surgery, um <coughs> and the percentage of body loss was 11 and 22 in this, um, in this group. <coughs> so we tried, tried to study the molecular changes that uh, is associated with the reduction in body weight in these two techniques. We also uh, did a targeted uh, approach uh, measuring uh, some of the um, known uh, biomarkers that would change with uh, change in, in body weight, uh, including IL-6, insulin, TNF-alpha, and so on. And interestingly, you can see that um, even if they lost weight in these two strategies, uh, uh, they would have different response to these molecules. Um, in diet, you can see here <coughs> that they, they dropped their insulin and the CRP. In surgery, they dropped their leptin, and interestingly, their adiponectin went up only in surgery, not with diet. <coughs> and we, we did the 2D gel studies. This is the gel uh, <coughs> for uh, the diet group, and this is the protein spots identified. And in, in surgery, no doubt, you have much more spots uh, which say that uh, the mechanism by which uh, these people lose weight uh, post-surgery is more complicated uh, than, than the diet approach. <coughs> uh, so the number of proteins identified post-diet was 28, post-surgery 110. And the hierarchical cluster analysis showed also significant difference between diet and uh, surgery. So these findings indicate that weight following bariatric surgery involves uh, changes in different proteins pathways uh, to those associated with weight loss by diet. And these differences provide important insight into the mechanism of weight loss and the reduction in comorbidities and risk factors arising from bariatric surgery. <coughs> so the second question that we studied um, is an interesting question, and you, uh, what, whatever epidemiological data you see, you, you can see a classical figure that links the body mass index to the complication of obesity. So an example is uh, serum triglycerides, total cholesterol, systolic blood pressure. So um, clear correlation between increment in BMI and these factors, okay? and also reduction in HDL. So we think that it might be as a continuum that the more body weight you gain, it just you are accumulating uh, fat and all this complication will occur as part of the same mechanism. Uh, we challenge this um, uh, hypothesis and we, our, our um, hypothesis was maybe there's something different in, in terms of uh, overweight and in obese subjects. Maybe the mechanisms are different, maybe the body is trying to do something different while they are overweight and then, then they are obese. So we went back to our bank and um, uh, our hypothesis that maybe unique metabolic and regulatory changes associated with overweight states distinct from obese population. And our objective was to identify differences in abundance of proteins and their associated pathways. Uh, with weight gain. So we, <coughs> we um, studied uh, lean individuals, overweight and obese, and these are the BMI. Classical cutoff point in, in our region is um, we use the 25 uh, kilogram per uh, meter square as an indication of overweight or lean. Uh, so this between 25 and 30, these are more than 40, so they are morbidly obese and these are lean people. 
<coughs> so again, with the same technique, separation of adipocyte biology, we, <coughs> we can see different um, uh, protein expression uh, in, in these um, uh, two conditions, overweight or obesity. So the protein spots common in morbidly obese and overweight was 42. Protein spots found in overweight was 13, and protein spots found in morbidly obese was 7. And this one increased uh, protein uh, expressions. Now, um, sports, sports decreased abundance compared to lean, 11 in overweight um, and morbidly obese, sorry, and overweight. In overweight alone, nothing had decreased, but in morbidly obese, we have 29. So, so if you compare these people to lean, you can see that the protein, uh, the differential expression of protein are different in, in the morbidly obese states and the overweight state. Uh, we would assume that we have the same uh, or at least similar protein changes, but these are significant difference in the, in the protein um, uh, signature in between these two conditions. So uh, when you do the uh, uh, ingenuity pathway network analysis, you can see that <coughs> in, uh, in overweight, yeah, we have the nf uh, and the ERK1 and 2 and MAP kinase P38, and these are mainly linked to cell, cell signaling and interaction and immune cell trafficking and chronic inflammation and free fatty acids that would induce insulin uh, resistance. Um, that's why in overweight uh, with, with time and insulin resistance, they will develop type 2 diabetes. Now, in, in obese, uh, it's sort of different um, signature and, and the, they have mainly uh, pathways involved in the lipid metabolism, insulin resistance, the same a small molecule biochemistry and cancer. <coughs> so the, at least this data showed that they are not a part of the same continuum. There are different uh, things going on uh, in the overweight state and then in the obese state. <coughs> and th this will show the um, different uh, protein involves and the clustering of uh, these three conditions uh, distinct from each other. And we concluded that the differences in the regulation of lipid and glucose metabolism regulation of redox state, inflammation, and the cytoskeletal organization between the overweight and the obese state. Uh, the overweight and morbidly obese groups increasingly express proteins supporting expansion of adipocyte tissue, uh, adipose tissue, while there is um, repression of lipid and energy generating path pathways in the morbidly obese. So these findings could offer an insight into the underlying changes uh, that occur when people start to gain weight and at the end of the spectrum when they become obese. I think we need additional studies to understand the mechanism behind these changes and in, in the protein expression. <coughs> now the third interesting uh, topic that we studied uh, is uh, uh, we know that obesity is related to aging. And uh, I'm sure you know that um, they are an interrelated conditions uh, so um, they affect the distribution of fat in both subcutaneous and visceral region. And they can lead to similar clinical outcomes, obesity and aging, uh, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and stroke. <coughs> so um, what would be the difference between these two conditions? Or would they, if, if you reduce your weight, would you be, uh, become more uh, younger? Is, is there any interaction between these two? We can, we can sell our products by saying that to people. <coughs> so so we, we go back to our biobank and see what can we uh, understand between the interaction similarities and differences between these two conditions. <coughs> so our objective was to examine the changes in protein expression within the subcutaneous adipose tissue of obese patients matched for BMI in relation to age. So they have the same BMI, but some are young, some are old. And the mature adipocytes were isolated by liposuction techniques from abdominal subcutaneous fat um, collected from both uh, groups. And the, we have the total protein extracts, and we did the uh, mass spec analysis on that. Differences in adipose tissue protein levels between young and aged uh, subjects may help to explain the variability in adipose tissue function observed in aged obese individuals. <coughs> so these are two groups we have here, uh, <coughs> and uh, this is the younger and this is the older. We could not have um, another uh, terminology to separate these two. I'm sorry for those who are 50. Uh, we need, we have, no, if you have any other terminology I can use, but we have the young and the old, and we have the EBMI which is uh, matching. 
So uh, <coughs> with getting the, uh, the normal uh, techniques that we do, uh, fat separation and the uh, 2D gel and the mass spec, <coughs> we identified <coughs> several, several uh, uh, pathways uh, that are different between these two conditions. To make it simple here, <coughs> you see in the old obese, uh, you have the, um, mainly the STAT3 pathway, which is um, taking a role here. And we have other proteins that are significantly uh, increased in relation to those who have the same percentage of body fat in their body, but they are young. So we are talking about maybe an interaction between these two conditions, whether aging is adding more uh, complex uh, uh, or make the picture more complicated. Uh, uh, the obesity in aged uh, population, maybe it's more complicated than studying obesity in young, we are not sure, but um, significantly there's a significant difference between these two conditions. And these are the protein spots that we identified. Uh, <coughs> some uh, went up and some went down. <coughs> so the differentially abundant protein investigated by the IPA uh, reveals signal as transducer and activator STAT3 pathway as a central molecule in the connectivity map. Uh, and the apoptotic pathway as a pathway um, with the highest score. Uh, we concluded that the proteomic analysis of uh, subcutaneous fat reveals differences in the abundance of proteins and adipocytes isolated from young versus old individuals. Uh, these differentially abundant proteins are involved in the regulation of apoptosis, cellular senescence, and inflammatory response. All these are common pathologic events in both obesity and aging. <coughs> so. Uh, what uh, we need to do further is to try to understand the role of certain proteins um, in, in the body metabolism and the regulation of body weight. <coughs> so this is an interesting data that we had uh, just um, um, come up with. Uh, we have not published this, so I'm not going to mention the, the molecule name here. But this is one of the molecules that we identified in the, in the urine sample of those who gained weight and lose weight, uh, lost weight. Uh, we we, we um, assess the expression of this molecule in 3T3L1 differentiated cells, and nicely it showed that it decreased with the differentiated uh, 3T3L1 cells. And uh, when we compare it in the mice and the inguinal and the epididymal fat, there was no significant difference between these two fat depots. Um, <coughs> however, in human, when we uh, uh, compare the expression in, vas in visceral adipose tissue and subcutaneous, we showed that it's more expressed in the subcutaneous adipose tissue. This is the first time to, to have this molecule uh, being studied um, uh, and expressed in the fat tissue. And also there is a trend, although not significant stat uh, statistically, uh, between the body mass index and the gene expression of this uh, molecule. Uh, from our biobank, we uh, were able to get a correlation of the serum level with the BMI, so the, the more the BMI, the higher the level of this molecule, and also the control group um, uh, after uh, gaining, uh, the, when you compare them with the obese, you have an increment in the level, and after um, diet, uh, 1500 calorie, uh, kilocalorie per day, we have a trend of a decrease in the um, expression of this um, protein in the, in the circulation. So uh, maybe this suggests a potential role of adipogenesis and or lipogenesis for this molecule. So, so we, we have a significant amount of data that we could uh, try to study on the uh, fat tissue and the circulation and link it to the uh, phenotypic changes that occur in, uh, in obese individuals. Uh, <coughs> the last section of my study is that, okay, let's, let's say we, we have an identification of a molecule or a protein. What would we, um, how would we validate these things? So we have uh, uh, initiated two uh, longitudinal cohort studies at King Saud University uh, that will allow us to follow people for 10 years. <coughs> so this the first study, we call it the Royal Study. It's the Riyadh Obesity Young Adults Longitudinal Cohort Study. Uh, we are going to follow uh, people with different BMIs uh, <coughs> for 10 years trying to uh, identify the subclinical changes that occur with body uh, gain <coughs> uh, before they develop the complication of uh, obesity, mainly type 2 diabetes. So we do uh, a biomarker uh, blood, uh, urine, and uh, stool collection, and carotid intimometer thickness, and um, also the um, uh, fat liver assessment. Um, <coughs> and the, the second uh, study 
and we do it with the collaboration with King Fahad Medical City. Uh, it is the cordial study. It's a non-alcoholic liver disease in Saudi cohort with type 2 diabetes. Um, <coughs> we try to determine the natural history of hepatic steatosis in type 2 diabetic and to validate the existing biomarkers of disease severity. Again, it's clinical and hard endpoints and to explore the pathogenesis and progressive disease using metabolic profiling technologies. So these studies will allow us to validate, validate uh, the, the proteins that might have a role in linking obesity to its complications. <coughs> so this is the uh, algorithm of the study and how we divide the uh, uh, steatosis, no, no steatosis based on the fibro scan and the ultrasound of the liver and the two years, three years and 10 years follow up of uh, the individuals. <coughs> so, um, I think the, the, uh, the philosophy that we, we have in, in terms of tackling um, uh, the link of obesity with its complication is very interesting. Uh, we start from the clinical problem. In the clinic, uh, identify um, um, those who are obese, uh, some of those who have significant uh, different phenotypic changes in relation to the common obese individuals, uh, trying to isolate uh, uh, fat tissue, uh, blood, urine, uh, doing uh, the proteomic studies and trying to make sense of that through the pathway analysis and then going back to the population through the cohort studies and uh, examining our uh, data. Uh, this is, I think, is a powerful approach for advancing our understanding of complex multifactorial obesity syndrome and also it will uh, helpful advance the knowledge in detecting early disease and implement effective preventive strategies like to end by thanking our uh, uh, research uh, team and our collaborators. <coughs> These are our co-investigators. Uh, we have uh, graduate students with us, undergraduate, and uh, we have the research assistant, and we are collaborating with the University of Colorado Denver and with Seoul National University, uh, with the um, University of London, and with the University of Cambridge and Warwick University in the UK. Uh, thanks for all these uh, people and, of course, for our a funding agency, King Saudi University, and uh, uh, King Abdul Aziz City of Science and Technology. Thank you. Thank you.